All right, um, we're going to begin <clears throat> a new series of studies tonight, which is kind of a kind of a a mini series in the book of James. Um, Matt had asked me a question Sunday morning about a, a verse that's in the book of James, and I was kind of thinking about maybe doing something in James anyhow. So I thought it would be a good time to do it. And um, we're going to we're not going to go verse by verse through the book of James or anything. We're just kind of kind of look at the book of James in, in general, the context of James, uh, why it was written, how it was written, who it was written to, who wrote it, um, that sort of thing, uh, because it is a book that causes a great deal of misunderstanding uh, and a great deal of confusion, even, um, especially for those of us that that understand Paul's distinctive message and. Paul's uh, gospel of salvation by grace through faith uh, without the works of the law. And then you come to James and, and there's some uh, passages in there, some verses in there that seem very contradictory to what Paul wrote, uh, especially about justification. There's some verses uh, about uh, healing, which is what uh, you know, Matt was asking me about, the, the, the passage. Uh, that's where the passage is. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Uh, and, and it's where we get the, the practice in the book of James of anointing with oil. You know, if any is weak, well, well, we'll, we'll read it here in just a few minutes. But so, so there's that. There's that instruction about healing uh, in, in the book of James. So there's several things where the instruction that James gives seems markedly different than what Paul gives, especially for us that are grace believers that, that believe that Paul is our example and, and, and the revelation to Paul is what we should follow. How do we, we answer some of these things in the book of James? In fact, um, Martin Luther, the great, the great reformer, uh, called James the book of straw. Uh, and actually it argued that it perhaps shouldn't even be a part of the canon of Scripture, that it shouldn't be in Scripture because it was so, uh, so opposed. Of course, Martin Luther began to see justification by faith without the works of the law. You know, it was by faith alone. And when he began to see that, and that was one of the things that led him away from the Roman Catholic Church uh, and, and led to the Reformation, as he began to see that, uh, he, he had trouble with the book of James. And uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't answer it and couldn't figure it out because you know, from his perspective and his understanding without understanding right division in Paul's unique place, he couldn't understand the contradiction between what the Bible says about justification by faith and what James seems to say about being justified by works. So, so as I said, we want to take the book of James and, and we're calling it the book of straw because that's what Martin Luther called the book of James, the book of straw. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about it not, not verse by verse, not go through every, every verse and every chapter and all of that, but just talk about it from the perspective of uh, what, what, what place does it hold, where should it stand in, in the scripture, and how should we understand it, and how should we understand some of these things that seem to contradict, especially the message in Paul's epistles. So let's just start, James chapter 1, verse 1. Of course, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And so, of course, you know, it's, it's written by James to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. We'll talk more in the coming weeks about you know, what that all means and why that's important and how that helps us put James in its proper context. But just as we begin tonight, as we go into the book of James, and hopefully I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's, it's two passages that we need to keep in mind, especially when you come to this book and you have someone of the stature of Martin Luther saying, well, this is a book of straw and, and probably doesn't even belong in the canon of Scripture and we should just get rid of it. Um, we can't do that. Uh, you know, our, our understanding is that, that the, the 66 books of, of the 39 of the Old Testament, 27 of the New Testament, the canon that we have delivered us in the King James Bible, all are the Word of God. And we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we, we read the passage that we look at so often to understand that and understand the place that Scripture has. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And we, we and certainly not me at least, can't just say about the book of James, 
or any book or any chapter when you come upon something that, well, this is kind of hard to understand and I don't really see how this fits and so let's just get rid of it. Uh, and, and that's sort of what Martin Luther wanted to do with the book of James. We're not going to do that. We're going to try to understand James in its proper context. Uh, but we do know that Scripture cannot contradict itself. So, so whatever, whatever James says in some way is compatible with what Paul says. And whatever James says about prayer and healing and justification is compatible with what the Bible says about prayer and healing and justification in other places. And if, if we don't get that compatibility and don't see it, it's not because the book doesn't belong there, it's because we just haven't figured it out yet. Um, you know, a more modern um, iteration of that is that what a lot of people will, will try to do when they see a verse or a passage that doesn't seem to fit with what they, what they think other passages say, the very common thing is to say, well, a better translation would be this. And if we, if we translated it this way, then it would agree with what I think over here about this passage. Um, that's done a lot with the end times passages that we've looked at over the past several years. You know, people will say, well, you know, th this doesn't fit with my paradigm of how the end times are. But if we translate, you know, if we made the, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and we made this, that, and this, that, then it would all fit together. So we really can't do that. You know, for our understanding of it, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We've studied the preservation of that scripture. We understand that in the King James Bible, we have the preserved word of God for English-speaking people. And in this study of James, we're going we're gonna to let the verses stand and say what they say but try to understand how they all reconcile together and fit. And we do that, obviously, if you go back a page in 2 Timothy to chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So our, our, our answer to these questions in the book of James, I, I already sort of hinted at it when we say, James to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, the answer is going to be to understand who's writing, to whom he is writing. There's that famous quote, um, I should have looked it up so I could quote it exactly, by Miles Coverdale, um, who was one of the early, early translators of the English Bible leading up to the King James Bible, who said, you know, when, when you study scripture, it will greatly to help you to, 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 note, to note who is speaking, to whom they are speaking, what comes before and what comes after, with what sense, all, all this. Basically, he's saying in a very flowery, old English way, Look at the context of any verse, and that context of that verse is going to help you understand the verse. So as we look at the book of James, we will be doing that consistently, looking at the context, the overall context of James, and then, then the people to whom he's speaking and, and what he's saying to them. So as we do that, we will rightly divide the word of truth um, and, and not just tear the verses apart, hopefully, but allow them to say what they say. So let's just get into the book of James a little bit tonight. Tonight what I want to do is is just point out some of the, the quote-unquote problem areas, some of the places people would point to and say, you know, uh, there, there's an instruction in the book of James that doesn't seem to match instruction that we would see in other places. So James chapter 1, one of those, those instructions that James gives, very specific instructions, in fact, about prayer and how we should pray and what we should expect when we pray and what we should pray about. And, and those instructions, we're going to then compare it to some instructions we see in Paul's epistles that seem to be very contradictory about prayer and how it works. So James chapter 1 and verse 4 is one place that James talks about prayer. He says this, uh, But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all, to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you have this, this, uh, this instruction about prayer and about asking of the Lord uh, in, in verse... Uh, you, he, want, he wants you to be perfect and entire in verse 4, wanting nothing. If you lack wisdom, ask of the Lord. And of course, he, he will, the implication is he'll, he'll give it to you. He giveth to all men liberally. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, verse 6. So it, it kind of gets back to some of those promises that we read in the book of Matthew that if you, whatsoever you ask in faith, believing, it shall be done. And James repeats that kind of 
prayer promise that if you ask these things in faith wavering and then and he even says you know a, a double mind uh let not a man think that he shall receive anything of the lord that man that man that is is wavering that is kind of tossed that's not not strong in his faith for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways so if you ask and well maybe god will give it to me maybe won't give it to me then you're not going to get it and of course that's a, a an excuse people use if someone is praying and praying and praying for something and they don't get it, they'll say, well, you know, you just, you don't have enough faith. Because, you know, if you have faith, it will be done for you. And, and you, you're probably wavering in your faith. And a double-minded man, he, he's, you're not going to get what you ask for. So James's uh, promise on prayer, if you go over to chapter 4, there's a, another promise. Chapter 4 and verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And, and that, uh, I don't know if any of you have had people quote that verse to you, but the, the end of verse 3 there, uh, you know, if somebody is saying, well, you know, I need this or I need that or I don't have this or I don't have that, in, 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 invariably you'll have somebody say, well, you have not because you ask not. If you want something from the Lord, you've got to ask him for it. Uh, and then ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And of course the implication there is that that you're going to know what to ask for. So you've got to ask for, you, you've got to know what to ask for, you've got to ask for the right thing, and when you ask for the right thing, then God is going to give it to you. Uh, if you look over to chapter 5, verse 16, uh, some other instruction about prayer. And we'll, we'll talk about this one quite a bit when we, when we get into studying it. Uh, James 5.16, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And there enters healing. We're going to look at healing as a separate issue. But in this passage about prayer, healing enters in there. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, uh, prayer is men I'm sorry, healing is mentioned in this prayer. Confess your faults for one another, pray for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then the illustration. Elias, verse 17, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her, th her fruit. So he uses Elias or Elijah as an example. He was a man like we are, subject to passions as we are. He prayed that it might not rain, and it rained not by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and it rained. So there you go, Shazam. He didn't want it to rain, it didn't rain. He prayed that it rain, and it rained. And that's how prayer works. And so you, you see these promises, and, and people will... And, and the promise, you know, this is sort of what, what Matt and I were talking about on Sunday. Um, the, uh, pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And you hear that verse quoted time and time and time again. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you should always pray. And then the illustration of that is, look what Elijah did. He stopped up the heavens that it wouldn't rain, and he prayed again, and it rained. So all of those promises, you have not because you ask not. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You can control nature with your prayers. You can heal the sick with your prayers. All that seems to contradict. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Romans 8 verse 26. Paul says this about prayer in Romans 8.26. Um, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the the passage in James says, You have not because you ask not, and you you Ask not and receive not because ye ask amiss. 
that you may consume it of your own lust. So the implication there is you're not asking for the right thing and therefore you're not receiving it. Here Paul says, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So Paul doesn't say, well, you haven't gotten it because you haven't asked for it and you asked for it, you've asked for the wrong thing. He says, you don't even know what to ask for. And that's a very different thing to say than, well, you have to ask for the right thing. How do we know what right thing to ask for? So why does James say, if you ask for the right thing, we'll give it, I'll give it to you, and you, ha- you don't have it because you haven't asked for the right thing. And Paul says, you don't even know what to pray for as you ought. And then he goes on and says more, and we'll look at that more when we, when we study this. But the, the, the instruction seems very different. And in Philippians chapter 4, of course, which is Paul's primary instruction on prayer, it, it's a very different, you know, James focuses on the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. He focuses on Elijah prayed that, that the heavens might be shut up and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and it rained again. When Paul talks about prayer, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, when Paul talks about prayer, this prayer promise that Paul makes, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. And we've talked about this promise many times. The, the thing that's specifically excluded from being kept in Paul's prayer is your body. Um, he doesn't say he'll keep your body. He says you'll keep your heart and your mind. Yet when James talks about it, he talks about the prayer of faith saving the sick and the Lord raising him up, healing his body. So, so why is it when Paul talks about prayer, it's a spiritual thing, to keep your heart and mind. When James talks about prayer, the Lord will raise him up, or the Lord will shut up heaven that it won't rain, or the Lord will cause the rain to come after three and a half years. It's a very different way of presenting prayer. It's a very different view of prayer. And even many grace believers fall into the trap of praying the way James says or the way Matthew says as opposed to the way Paul says. Um, but the verses are there so you got to deal with them. Why is James' instruction so different than Paul? And that's one of the contrasts we'll look at and seek to rightly divide the word of truth to understand the context in which James makes those promises and what they mean, and the context in which Paul makes his promises to us and what they mean to us. Back to the book of James now, chapter 5, and it's, it's related to what we just read, uh, the verses right before the verses about prayer, where James talks about the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, Right before that, then this is specifically the, specifically the verse that, that Matt and I were talking about, verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And that's, of course, a practice that you see oftentimes, you know, the, uh, the anointing oil, anointing someone with oil. Is any sick among you? I'm sorry, uh, verse, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And, and that, you know, the prayer of faith. And people make that a, very, a special, you know, if, if, if the Lord wants this person to be healed, he'll enable someone to pray this special prayer of faith, and then they'll be raised up when they're anointed with oil. And I remember when I just had, had, had started preaching, I was just a teenager, and, and I went to a church to preach, and it was a church that, why well, they invited me, I don't know, but, uh, but they, 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 uh, they practiced anointing with oil. And I'll never forget that that you know that they had a man come forward in the service. He was he was he actually came down the aisle in a wheelchair, got out of his wheelchair, knelt down at the altar, and the pastor came up and anointed him with oil. And the the elders prayed over him. They laid hands on him. They prayed over him. And and I'll never forget. That. So you read that verse: the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And and in that service he. He, he grabbed onto the altar rail, pushed himself back up, sat back down in his wheelchair, 
they turned him around and wheeled him back down the aisle. And even back then, that's I don't know, 50, well, 45 years ago, I was like, well, no, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> you know? Because it says, the, the, you call for the elders, you anoint them with oil, you pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord shall raise him up. But that didn't happen there. But yet, every I, I will guarantee you, probably right in this city, every Sunday, uh, that that's happening. So, so what is it? You know, what does that? If that promise means anything, and if we're to take God at His word at all, what in the world does that promise mean? And then again, it seems to be very different. If you go back to Second Corinthians chapter twelve, it seems very different than the instruction that that Paul gives us um, about you know what happens when you pray. Uh, we'll just look at, at one you know illustration of it here tonight. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. And this is, I'm sure you're familiar with this, verse 7, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather, therefore, rather, uh, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So, so why is it that here in this passage, um, Paul prays that this thing be taken away, and and it doesn't happen? If you go over to Second Timothy chapter four. Um, and verse 20, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20, uh, he, he mentions uh, Trophimus, Erastus abode at Corinth. He's just you know, talking about some of his, his co-workers. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Now if Trophimus was helping Paul in his ministry and, and, and an assistance to Paul in his ministry, why in the world didn't Paul call the, the elders of the church at Miletus together and have them pray over him and anoint him with oil and raise him up? So, so Paul's, again, you know, not only through, through real life experience, you see, you see prayer, you see, okay, whatsoever you ask in faith believing you'll receive it you have not because you ask not so if you want something ask for it have you ever asked God for anything and not gotten it probably probably if you're if you're normal at all you probably have so just through experience and then you look at Paul's instruction and you say well that's that's really not what Paul tells me to do anyhow same is true with with, um, with, with healing you know, have, has, has anybody ever gotten anointed with oil and been prayed for and all that? And, and it, didn't, it didn't work. You know, I, I, I saw two things in my life. I saw that, um, you know, that, that man that I spoke about that was anointed with oil, um, before that even, uh, I, I was at a, a church service uh, in a denominational church. There's a he healing service, you know, and the, the man came down, uh, the, the man said, come on down. And this, this dear, sweet old woman walked down the aisle, and I remember she was so, so bowed up with arthritis, you know, her, her, her legs were, were like, like, like a wishbone, like a chicken wishbone. And she, she hobbled down the aisle, and she had, you know, I don't know, pleurisy or some, some internal thing that you, know, you couldn't really see, bronchi, I don't know what. Um, and she knelt down, and the guy prayed for her, and, and she, oh, I, I, I feel warmth inside, and I know the Lord healed me of my pleurisy or whatever I have. And then she, Saint, she got back up, and she hobbled back the aisle with her bowed legs like a chicken wishbone. But, you know, so, so the Lord could heal the pleurisy, but not, not the, the bent legs and the arthritic legs. And you know, you go look at the verses when Jesus Christ is healing, and time and time again it says that he, they, they made everyone whole. That means if you came to the Lord for healing and you had cancer and arthritis and heart disease, guess what you went away with? None of them. None of them. You didn't come with cancer and go away and die the next day of a heart attack. That's not the way it happened. And you didn't come with 
with, with a heart problem and arthritis and have to hobble away with a good heart. The Lord made them whole. So just by observation, you see that this thing in James is not working. And then you look at Paul and you say, well, you know, from what Paul says, it, it doesn't seem like it should work. But how do you reconcile those things? How can the same God writing the same Bible give instruction here that looks like this and instruction over here that looks like this? And you can't even get away with saying, well, that's the Old Testament. Because sometimes we like to do that, right? Well, that's the Old Testament. You know, we know that Old, that old Testament stuff. Nobody believes that garbage anymore. Adam and Eve and all that. We don't believe all that. This is all New Testament stuff. This is James and Paul giving seemingly very different instruction about these things. So, so we need to, to, to be able to reconcile that together. And finally, maybe one of the most important things, if you look in James chapter 2, and this is one that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at in, in detail and take some, some thought and some explanation. And this is one that if you really want to... Um, have a good intellectual exercise sometime. You listen to, listen to, uh, I listened on TV one time to a Roman Catholic priest and a fundamentalist preacher debate, debate James chapter 2 because Roman Catholicism hangs on James chapter 2 beginning in verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can, save, can faith save him? Now, if I just ask you that question, can faith save you? What would you say? Yes. <laughs> we just Sunday morning, we just spent Sunday mornings the last I don't know how many weeks talking about all these terms of salvation, one of which was faith, and how you receive all those things by simple faith. If a brother, verse fifteen, or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, so if, if some brother's destitute and, and doesn't have enough to eat or enough clothes to wear, and you say, well, yeah, go ahead, have a good day. <laughs> what does that help? Hope, you, hope you're feeling better. Hope you do better. What, is, what good does that do? Well, it doesn't do any good, obviously. But then he says, verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest then how that faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers, and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also." And you give that to a Roman Catholic priest or a, you know, a Jesuit theologian, he will beat you over the head with it so you are bloody and bruised and you'll never recover. Because that's, that's it. That's the passage right there. If you want to talk about where, where Roman Catholicism gets its emphasis in its, of, of works, 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 the sacraments, receiving grace by the sacraments and receiving faith by confession and all the, it's right there. That's it. Yet, keep your hand there and go over to Romans chapter 3. And, you know, we, we just talked about this the past few Sunday mornings. As I said, Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And chapter 4, verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now you can't hardly find two passages of scripture that are more contradictory, seemingly, on the surface, than those two. And, and that's, these are the ones I mentioned earlier on that Roman, or yeah, that Martin Luther 
as he began to come out of the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and understand justification by faith, these, these are two of the passages, or the, the, it's this, this doctrine, the doctrine of justification by faith, that made him say, the book of James is the book of straw. It, 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 it shouldn't even be in the canon of Scripture. We should just get rid of it. Because he couldn't reconcile. You know, he, he was coming to understand what Paul says about justification by faith, but then he, he keeps tripping on the book of James. And interestingly enough, both James, if you look back there in James chapter 2, um, verse number 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest then how faith wrought with, with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. He, 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 James points to Abraham, Father Abraham, and says, Abraham clearly is justified by works. Then you get to Romans chapter 4, and verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So Paul points back to Abraham and says, see there, it's clear as the nose on your face. Abraham was justified by faith. James points back to Abraham and says, see there, it clears the no in your face. James or Abraham was justified by works. So you've got pretty clear doctrine by Paul. Justification is by grace through faith without the works of the law. You got pretty clear statement by James, faith without works is dead. Faith works work with faith, and by faith, by faith plus works you're justified. And they both point to Abraham and say, see, see Abraham? See Abraham? So we're going to talk about that. What, why? And, and I'll tell you, this is the one, if you want to understand how to, how to argue against Roman Catholicism or how to, to debate, if you ever get a debate with a Jesuit priest, this, this is the passage right here that you've got to deal with. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you treat all the New Testament as being doctrine for the body of Christ, it's, it's really going to trip you up. Now, there is an explanation to it. Um, it's, even, even outside of rightly dividing the word of truth, there's an, under, there's an understanding of what James is saying here. But when you rightly divide the word of truth and understand the context, who's saying it and to whom they're saying, it, it makes it much, much easier to, to understand what James is saying and what Paul's saying. So we're going to spend a couple of weeks, we're just going to look at the context of James first, you know, who, who was it written to, what, who, who was James, and all that kind of thing. Um, but then look, uh, spend at least a week looking at each one of these individual things. At when James and Paul talk about healing, when James and Paul talk about prayer, and when James and Paul talk about salvation, and, and how we reconcile what the two men are saying uh, by rightly dividing the word of truth. So we'll get into that as we move on with our study. So let's have a word of prayer, and if you have a question, we can certainly answer it. Um, our God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, for the opportunity of looking to word tonight and studying it together. And as we continue on with this study uh, of the book of James, we pray that uh, we would do so realizing that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And uh, to study it with understanding, we must rightly divide the word of truth. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, any questions about tonight? We're going to, like I said, get into the, it's, it's not going to be verse by verse through the book of James, but it's going to be those three doctrinal areas where there's a lot of uh, confusion about the book of James. And yeah, if, if you want to, if you want to, you know, read, read some Roman Catholic commentaries on James sometimes and you know, they, just, they, just, they just rip the Protestants up one side and down the other with that. So, um, all right, let's uh, be dismissed Sunday morning. See you all. Don't forget.